Welcome to everybody who's joining us for the first time. I know there's a several of you. I'm looking at the queue. And also, for those of you who have been with me for many sessions, it is darn great to have you. My name is Keith Barker. I'm a double CCIE. I've been working with Cisco for close to 20 years and a CCIE since 2001. And I got another one in 2003. And I've kept current on specific technologies in Cisco ever since then. Our objective in this session today, this live stream, is twofold. Number one identify when do we expect a DR, a designated router, to show up on a network segment with OSPF. And then secondly, after we expect one to show up or not, if it does show up, will there be a type 2 LSA? Now, if you're just joining us for the first time, there's a master playlist. I, I would encourage you to go through that and make sure you have all these pieces in order. But one of the things that happens in OSPF is that OSPF neighbors, they love each other. <laughs> <laughs> and they form full, full adjacencies with each other. And all that means, if we have router one and router two, and they both agree on several things, and if you have neighbors that want to really get close, they have to agree on some things to get along, here's what OSPF neighbors have to agree on. They have to agree on the timers. Like, hey, how often are you going to send hello messages? And if I don't hear hello messages from you uh, in a certain period of time, that could cause a problem. But they have to agree on what those timers are. So you know, 10 seconds by default or whatever the number is, it's, they have to agree on those. They also have to agree on the street. Imagine you and a neighbor on the same street, but your neighbor thought it was Elm Street and you thought it was First Street. You have to agree. So you have to agree on the timers. You have to agree on the, the actual network itself. There's other things we have to agree on too, like authentication. If one router says, hey, I think we should be using authentication, like, like a password you know, to prove who we are and our updates. If the other router doesn't think that, they won't become neighbors. They won't neighbor up. Um, what else do they have to agree on? Oh, they have to agree on whether or not they expect to have a designated router for the segment. So if one router says, I think we should have a designated router for this segment because that way we can all do full adjacencies with the DR and not have to do full peer-to-peer -peer relationships, adjacencies with everybody. If one believes that and the other doesn't, they won't become neighbors. They also need to agree on the area type. So in, in, C in CCNA, one area type, and that is the backbone, single area. But as we get and grow our networks, we could have multiple areas, and those areas could be like a stub area, which helps limit the routes that get in, the LSAs that go into that area. But So they have to agree. So two neighbors that want to agree, they have to agree on, is there going to be a DR or isn't there going to be a DR? So that's a question I like to address in this video, and it's going to be a very quick discussion because it's not going to take a lot to cover that piece. And then we'll demo it as we go. And then the second part is this. Once we have a designated router, in a single area OSPF network, what we're going to experience is that every router wants to let everybody else know about itself. And it does that with a, a link state advertisement. Think of a link state advertisement as a, a resume, <laughs> a resume for a router. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. Here's all my information. I've got an interface connected here and here and here and these directly connected networks. That's my information. So whenever you think of a, an LSA, a link state advertisement in OSPF, as a type one, which is a router LSA, every router is going to generate it and it's going to have all the details about that router. Super simple. Well, yeah, pretty simple. If you have 10, 10 routers in an area, you're going to have 10 LSA type ones, from, one from each router that talk about them respectively. Now, if we have a network segment that is using a designated router and there's more than two or three, there's more, there's more than one OF, OSPF speaker or router on that network segment and all the routers believe it should be a designated router or there should be a designated router, then the designated router in that case will generate an LSA type 2. And that LSA type 2 simply says this, hey, everybody in the area, I got some news for you. I'm the designated router, says the designated router. And there's this network segment that I'm connected to. I'm the DR for it. And here's my interface ID, my IP address as the designated router on that segment. And, and Here's all the other routers that are attached. The benefit of that is that a router anywhere in the area who gets that LSA can say, oh, so routers one, two, three, four, and five are all connected to that same network segment, great. And it has the router one, the type one LSAs for all those other routers, which has their individual links. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, but every router in OSPF has all the pieces. I know what the common networks are. They have two or more OSPF routers because the designated router generated an LSA type two. And I know about all the individual routers because they all generate an LSA type one with all of their interfaces. But what's going to be surprising for most of you is that if we have a designated router for a segment, 
And let's imagine you and I are the designated router. So let's boot up. Boot. Oh, we run OSPF, we're running, and we have an interface on a multi-axis network, meaning like an Ethernet network. And we look around, we don't hear any hellos, therefore we don't go into the init or two-way state or X start or exchange or loading or full because there's nobody else to peer with. So we're all alone. <laughs> we sniff a little bit and say, I wish I wasn't so lonely on this segment. But after a period of time, we identify there's nobody showing up here. I guess I'll go ahead and have, a, have an election. It's like an election where there's one voter. That's the electorate. <laughs> like I'm voting for myself as the DR because I have the highest router ID on this network segment. It also has the highest priority on its interface. The default priority is one for OSPF. Anyway, there's no competition. It's really easy to win an election if there's no competition. So it becomes the DR. And then it says to itself, you know, there's nobody else on this network segment. Nobody. So I don't, no one needs to know. And they have my type one LSAs already that say, hey, I'm connected to this network. But because there's no other routers there, even though it's a DR, and DRs are expected to generate an LSA type two, that DR for that network with nobody else there, it's gonna say, I'm not gonna bother advertising a uh, LSA type two because nobody else is here. It's just wasted information. It's like sending an uh, LSA type two that says, hey, I'm connected to this network and nobody else is connected to it. And all the other routers would say, well, yeah, I, I could learn that from your LSA type ones. So what is surprising to most people is that LSA type twos indeed are generated by a designated router for a multi-axis segment where there are two or more routers present running OSPF on that same segment. But if there's only one, there's no, DR, there's no LSA type two for it. So those are the two pieces that I wanted to cover in this live stream and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Actually, what I'd love to do is show you in the interface how we can configure that, verify that, see it, reinforce it, and then I'd encourage you to practice it. And you can practice it in Packet Tracer, or if you have live gear, that's great, or if you have viral, or if you have some other emulator or simulator, fantastic. I would encourage you to practice it. So let's take a look at our topology that currently has no OSPF running whatsoever, and then we'll reinforce what we just discussed by taking it through step by step by step. So here is our topology. And just to point out the lay of the land here, I've got the green links represent gigabit speed and the yellow links represent fast ethernet speed. And, the, and this lightning bolt here in red indicates a serial connection, which is, which is uh, very, very slow. In this case, it's 1.54 megabits per second. Very, very slow as far as throughput goes. Now let's, let's address the first question, DR or no DR, is, that is the question. Is the doctor in the house? And it really boils down to this one thing actually, the network type, meaning the OSPF learned or believed network type. And if we are on Ethernet, what happens by default, the router looks at that Ethernet interface, which got included in OSPF from a network statement. We've covered that previously. And what it'll do, it'll say, oh, this is an Ethernet network. I'm going to default and think that this is a broadcast type. I'm going to put OSPF here in front. And OSPF broadcast type the network just because of the layer two encapsulation. It's Ethernet. It just assumes it. Now you can manually change that, but that's the default behavior. On the other hand, if we were over here on these serial interfaces, the layer two encapsulation on serial interfaces is not Ethernet. So it could be PPP for point to point protocol, or it could be Cisco's proprietary HDLC. But in those situations, it's going to assume that the interface type, like if it's PPP, it's going to assume that the OSPF network type is point to point. I'll just abbreviate that. And as a result, if it's a point to point, it's not expecting a DR. So this, the, way to, the easy way to remember this is this. If the OSPF network type has the word point in it, there's no DR expected. So that means point to point, point to multipoint, if you're dealing with some really old topologies that no longer are relevant in current networking. But if it has the word point in it for the network type, that means no DR. If it says broadcast, okay, so that's the first rule. Rule number one, if it has the word point in it, we're not expecting a DR, we're just doing full adjacencies, done. <laughs> if it is broadcast, which is the default for ethernet, or if you're on an older topology, 
that doesn't support broadcast, you can use a type called non-broadcast. And if the word broadcast is in that first part of the network type, there's there's also a point to multipoint non-broadcast, which is a super corner case from like a decade ago. So the two major types that do require a, a DR or expecting a DR is broadcast or non-broadcast. And you might say, well, Keith, by default on Ethernet, you said that the network type is going to be broadcast. Yes. And if it is, and you leave it that way, we're expecting to have a DR for every segment. So that means we'd have a DR here, a DR here, a DR here, a DR for this network, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. And every common Ethernet subnet, we're gonna, we're expecting to have a DR on each one of those because of the network type. In non-broadcast, what that is, is when you have to manually specify your neighbors. So you'd actually hard code and say, on a network that doesn't support broadcast, which is not Ethernet, but a network that didn't support broadcast, but it's multi-access, like a hub and spoke, so you have a hub site, and three branches, and you're using like frame relay or something really old like that, where this is just one subnet. Basically, if this guy sends a broadcast, it's not gonna be seen by all the other spokes by default, because it would just really be going over this circuit with the wide area network service. So in that case, it'd be, it could be considered non-broadcast, and then you could go ahead and manually configure neighbors. You could tell this router, hey, neighbor with this guy, and neighbor with that guy, and neighbor with that guy specifically, and if you do that, the non-broadcast also is expecting that, hey, somebody in this network is going to be the DR. So in short, if it says broadcast in the first few words of the network type, it's going to expect to have a DR. And if it doesn't, if it has point in it anywhere, the word point, like point to point or point to multipoint, it's simply assuming, hey, no DR needed. Because on a point to point circuit or a point to multipoint as well, we're just going to assume we're going to go into a full adjacency with everybody. So what does a full adjacency mean? It means that we are going to care about each other. We are going to track each other. We are going to send updates if things change to each other. And we are going to synchronize our database, our link state. We're going to synchronize the LSAs we've learned about in this thing called the link state database with that neighbor. That's what it means. OK, so that's the question of DR or no DR. It's all based on the network type. So let me clear off that screen. And let's take a look at another scenario. And that other scenario would be this. Let's imagine that this network right here, and a question from the last stream was, hey, how come this is just like one network? This is the 10.0.12 network with a 24-bit mask over here. Dot R1 is dot one, and R2 is dot two. How come that's like, uh, like one network? Isn't there like this middle device? If this core switch, is acting just as a layer two connectivity point. Both of these ports on the switch are both in VLAN 1 or VLAN 10. Effectively, those two routers, router 1 and router 2, are on the same subnet. So that would be one network. If we carved out these interfaces as layer three interfaces, the physical interfaces, then the story would change. But these are just two access, port, port, access ports on the switch in the same VLAN. So we have the 10.0.12 network. And if we wanted to, we could bring core one into the party because core one is a multi-layer switch. So if this is, I honestly don't know, I'll have to look at the topology. If this is VLAN 10 that these two interfaces are in, or if it's VLAN 10, uh, one, whatever it is, core one, we could just poof, create a virtual interface, an interface VLAN for that VLAN. And then we could have core one peer with these devices. And that way we could have three OSPF routers or speakers on that segment. So for more details on multi-layer switches and switch virtual interfaces and the options there, please check out in the master playlist the video that most resonates with you to talk about the details of that, including the multi-layer switching for inter-VLAN routing. Okay, and also like the second or third video in the playlist covers uh, switching and trunking and VLANs and so forth. That'll help as a, a good boost to that as well. Okay, so let me clean that off and let's talk about the DR and BDR status here. So in R1 and R2, if we bring up, let me bring up R1 first. If we bring up R1, and let me go ahead and do that, yeah. If we bring up, if we bring up R1 all by itself, meaning R, when I say bring up, running OSPF, it boots first with OSPF configured or we configure OSPF first, it'll come up and say, hey, I don't see anybody. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I guess I'll be the DR, has a little election, and it would become the DR if it came up first. 
then after it's the DR, then if we brought up R2, R2 would say, hey, I see the hello messages from R1, and I see in those hello messages, I see my own router ID after a few moments, and then that would go to init, and the two-way, and the IT elf, <laughs> the X start, X change, loading in full, as we talked about in a previous video with the OSPF neighbor states. And they would become fully adjacent with each other. And as along the way, R2 would also become the BDR. And even though R2, it could have a higher OSPF priority on the interface. It could have the best router ID in town. And that's the two, two factors, by the way. Who has the highest router, who has the highest IP OSPF priority on the interface, and if they're equal, who has the highest router ID. But if DR, if R1's already the DR, it's a done deal. There's no preempting. R2's not gonna sh come in and say, yeah, I'm gonna do it. You know, it's gonna say, I, I see that you're there. And that's because we want stability on the network. We don't want uh, a new device coming up to change the roles and possibly disrupt network activity. So it's graceful in how it comes on, and it won't be a, it won't be a distractor. It won't uh, push out the existing DR. And again, we could control that with a priority on the interfaces or the router IDs if, if, if both routers are brought up at the same time. And that's when they would duke it out and the one with the best priority would win. And if they were the same priority of one by default, then the router with the highest router ID would win and it would become the DR and the other one would become the BDR. All right, so let's do this. Let's bring up R1 by itself. And we can take a look at the fact that it's gonna be the DR for several segments if we bring up R1. And I'd like you to predict with me, based on this topology that we're looking at right here, and go ahead and put this in the chats, based on this router with its three interfaces, gig 00, gig 10, and 20, and all those interfaces start with 10.0 something. So if we do a network statement, we go into router, OSPF, and we give it a process ID of one, put my little spaces there and press enter. Now we're in router configuration mode and then we put in a network statement. We've had nuggets or videos on network statements. That's a Freudian slip there. <laughs> I work with CVT nuggets so much that uh, everything we do there is considered a nugget, like a little gem. And uh, I use that term quite a bit. Anyway, we've had that in previous videos here on YouTube as well. So if we put a network statement of 10.0.0.0 and then a wildcard mask of 0.0.255.255 what that means is that these two zeros here mean that we want to match exactly on the first two octets. So, and then these last two octets of 255 in the wildcard mask say we don't care about the last two octets that we're putting in there. There's zeros as placeholders. So the router would then say, great, I get it. I get it. Here's what I'm going to do, says the router. I'm going to look at all of my interfaces that are currently up and I'm going to look at the IP addresses on those interfaces and any interfaces that start with 10.0 because you didn't care about the last two octets. Any interfaces that begin with 10.0, I'm including those in OSPF, meaning I'll start doing hellos out of all those interfaces. And as far as an OSPF routing, I'll include those directly connected networks. So the networks hanging off here off R1 could be 24-bit networks or 16-bit networks or 8-bit networks. It, it, all of them are coming in if the first two octets match 10.0 on the actual interfaces. So I, I propose that we do exactly that here on R1. We'll just go ahead and bring it in and that will enable OSPF on those interfaces and then we'll take it from there. So let me go ahead and clear that off. Let me see if I have a lab that will cooperate with me. I think I do. And one of the first things we're gonna do before we start configuring R1 is let's verify we're on the right device. A show IP interface brief will be a really good start to that. And, all right, so gig 00, which is this interface right here, the one that's going off to the switch and to this network over here on the left, that is, has an IP address of 10.0.1, great. And then 10.1.0 is the interface that is connecting into the core switch, which is in the same VLAN as router two. That's great. And then gig two slash zero is the interface that goes down to our, R4, and let me verify that real quick. Yeah, goes, oh, down to R3. Yeah, R1's not connected to R4, down to R3 right here, this guy right there, interface 2.0. Great, I'm glad I looked. It's always good to make sure we're clear on. Also, we could do this, we could do a show CDP neighbors, and that will show us who we're connected to. 
So R1 off its gig one slash zero is connected to the core switch and off of its gig two zero, it's connected to R3. That confirms it as well. Also, if we wanted to see whether or not we had routing currently set up, we could do a show IP protocols. That'll show us our dynamic routing protocols. And that basically says, nope, <laughs> no RIP, no EIGRP, no routing protocols, no OSPF, nothing's there. So we'll let's go ahead and configure. We'll go into configuration mode and we'll specify router, OSPF, and a process ID. Uh, I'm going to use one, but you could use any process ID you want as long as you're consistent on this router. It doesn't have to match across multiple routers. It's just a local, it's like running an application and it's just keeping track of this application called OSPF. And in some environments, if you had to run two or three separate instances, which gets into the CCNP and CCIA level stuff, uh, then you could use different processes to control which networks are in which process. But for most of the time, you know, one single OSPF routing process, and I'm gonna use 6783, <laughs> just because you can. It's just a number that's identifying this routing process. And then we'll put in a network statement. And the network statement we'll do is 10.0.0.0. And just like our plan, we'll say that we don't, we, we wanna match exactly on the first octet, we wanna match on the second octet, and we don't care about the third octet or the fourth octet. So basically, on this router, any interfaces that begin with 10.0, anything, are about to be included if I, <laughs> are about to be included in area zero if we press enter. And it's done. And to verify that, we can do a show IP OSPF interface. And I'll put a brief on there as well so we just get the nice high level overview. So there's show IP OSPF interface brief. And what it's doing right now, this is the router one hoping to find a friend. Like, okay, is there something out there already on these network segments? And just to be clear where those are, these are these three network segments right here. This one, this one, which is really, back that off, which is really this one, and this one. Those are the three network segments. And it's saying, okay, I just came up, I'm new here. It's like joining my Discord server, our Discord server. Hey, I'm new here, uh, you know, how do I get along or what do I do, what are the rules, check the rules out. And it's looking and listening to see if there's any neighbors out there or any potential neighbors that it can go into the init and two-way state and you know all the rest. And whether there's a DR or BDR, it's ready. So if there's a DR and BDR on that segment or any one of these segments, R1 would come in as a DR other if there's a DR and a BDR already present. And it would make full adjacencies with the DR and BDR and then life would go on. But right now it's sad. It's sad because there's, there's nobody out there. So effectively, this router is going to win. We would expect him to be the DR for this segment and the DR for this segment and the DR for this segment. We could say, I guess, the DR is in, the doctor is in. And that's because there's no competition, there's nobody out there. Also, router one knows there's nobody else out there because he's listening for hellos, not seeing anything at the moment. And so he's gonna become the DR and he's gonna have a router LSA, but here's what he's not going to do. Router one says, I all by myself don't want to be all by myself anymore. Oh yeah, that was good. I kid. It doesn't, it, because there's nobody else on these segments, it's not going to bother creating any LSA type twos. It just says there's nobody else who cares. Nobody needs that information. There's not multiple routers on this any of these segments. And so it won't generate an LSA type two for this network or this segment or this segment because there's simply no other OSPF routers present. So it doesn't matter. All the information that anybody would ever need from R1 is in its LSA type ones. So we can verify that by going back to the interface and we'll do an up arrow. There we go. So now it's the doctor, doctor, give me the news. I got a bad case of lonely blues. It's just, um, it's Sunday, singing on Sunday. So there's the state. And if we do a show IP OSPF neighbors, it's got nothing, nobody's there. But he is the DR and he's the DR for the current segments. But if we do a, now the question might come up, well, Keith, how do you verify? Let's go to this. How do you verify whether or not this router is generating LSA type twos or not? because he shouldn't be, because there's no common network segment that it's the DR for that has more than one, more than itself on it. And that's the condition for generating the actual LSA type two, is that there's a multi-axis segment 
and there's more than one router speaking OSPF on it, so the DR would then generate an LSA type 2. The way we can verify it is this. Check this out. We can just ask to see the collection of LSAs, and the way they, they call that the LSA database. And we see that with the show IP OSPF database, just like that. And there it is. This is router one's type one LSA. And if we opened it up and did a show, oh, look right there. See how it says three for the link count? That in measurable terms means I have three links. <laughs> yeah. And it's telling anybody who wants to hear about it with this LSA about its links. And we could do a show IP OSPF database. And then we could type in router, which is effectively a type one. And if you had like 20 routers in the area, you could also put in the link ID, which is the router ID, and it would just show you that one. Because we only have one, we can press enter, and it'll show us the details for that router ID, for that LSA type one. And so this is basically saying, here is my, I'm the, I'm the advertising router, here's my link state ID for my, route, for my LSA type one, which is the router ID. So as you look at the router IDs, that's why it's helpful to hard code them or know what they are. That way, when you see an IP address, you're not thinking, uh, who is that? It's very easy to tell this is R1 because I have a loopback on R1, which is the router ID, which is very easy to pick out from a crowd. And then he talks about, hey, I've got three links in this detail of this link state advertisement, this router LSA, and here they are. I've got this network, 10.0.13. I've got this network, 10.0.12. And I've got this network, 10.0.1. And it has the mask included. It's all great. And look what it's saying this right here. It says that each of those is a stub. Now, what this means is that nobody else is out there. <laughs> that's what it means. It means I'm the only OSPF speaker on this network. And that's the reason that if it's a stub, meaning there's nobody else on this network segment, it won't bother generating an LSA type two at all. And that's why we don't see it in the database. If we do a show IP OSPF database again, <laughs> it's pretty thin. Just one type one LSA from router one talking about its links. So let's, let's change this up a little bit and let's go ahead and add R2 to the mix. And when we enable OSPF on R2, what we'll expect to have happen is R2 will look on the network. You'll see the hellos coming in. It will identify that, hey, R1's already here. It'll also know from the exchanges that R1's the designated router. And they'll go through the init and two-way and xstart and exchange and loading state, get into a full adjacency. And then their link state databases, their, their collection that we just looked at of the LSAs will be exact except for the age, because R2 learned it later. But as far as the actual data in the LSAs, they will be identical, because every router in an area has the same copies of the LSAs, all the jigsaw puzzle pieces, so they can actually build the map of how they should forward through the network from their perspective, because they have all the data. And also, when R2 shows up, R1's gonna say, I'm not alone. And as a designated router, it, we should expect to see that it's gonna start generating LSA type twos that describe that common network, the 10.0.12 network. And it's gonna say, hey, I've got this network, 10.0.12, and there's two people on it, me, says router one, and router two. And that's the reason it started to generate it because it's no longer a stub, meaning it's, that network is no longer a dead end. There's, there's now another OSPF speaker on that common network, and then it's gonna consider it no longer a stub, it's gonna be a, a transit network. A transit network is a fancy way of saying, hey, I'm not the only person who could possibly forward traffic off this network. There's multiple OSPF speakers here. So let's take a look. So here on R1, that's done. We'll go to R2. And here on R2, we'll do a show IP interface brief just to verify that we're on the right device. Great. So it's got all the right IP addresses. If we look at our topology to make sure we're all here together, we have gigs 20, which is 10.0.12. And then the last octet is two. And then, oh, it's got here gigs. This is not on our topology, but I just saw it in the interface. Gig 00 is 10.0.2 with a dot two. And then this link right here is 10.0.24.0. And I just use the router number. So between R1 and 2 is 0, 012. And between R2 and R4, it's router it's network 24 for that third octet. And the last octet of its IP address is going to be dot two. And we can verify that very easily by just going back and taking a look. All right, so, yep, that looks perfect. Let's just show IP protocols, just to verify we're not running OSPF yet, and we'll enable it. So configuration mode, router, OSPF, 
Process ID one, two, three, A, B, C. Doesn't matter. OSPF process ID is just local to the router. You don't have to have the same process ID across your network. Most people will <laughs> or have some logic in it, but it doesn't have to be. And I will use the loopback address as the router ID. So there's the loopback address right here. So by default, OSPF is going to choose a configured router ID, or if that doesn't exist, the highest loopback address. If that doesn't exist, the highest IP address on any interface other than a loopback. So the router ID is going to be 2222 because we're not going to hard code it. And there it is. There's the loopback. So we'll do a network statement. And let's do network 10.000. And let's do a wildcard mask. In fact, yeah, let's do a wildcard mask that says we care about matching on the first octet, just to mix it up a little bit. And we don't care about the second octet, third octet, or fourth octet. And we'll dump all those matching interfaces in area zero. So what that means is that it, the router is going to look at its IP interfaces. <laughs> it's going to identify, hey, these three interfaces, gig 00, gig 10, gig 20, they all start with 10. That's a match. You didn't care about matching on the last three octets because of this wildcard mask. And as a result, I'm going to include those three interfaces and whatever networks are attached to them. And that, that means like, a 12-bit network or a 24-bit network or a 16-bit network or a 19-bit network. It doesn't matter about the actual masks on those interfaces. It's really a three-step process. Which interfaces match based on the network statement? Secondly, bring those interfaces into OSPF and also include any directly connected networks on those interfaces and you're done. So that's the process. So we would expect after we press enter here to have those interfaces in OSPF. So we'll do a show, IP OSPF interface brief. And sure enough, now on this network segment right here, this is gig 2.0. That's the common interface that's between R1 and R2. And because there was a DR already there, it was set up, and that was R1. Basically, R2 said, yep, I see the DR, and I will join in. There's no BDR, so it became the BDR. And in that process of the full adjacency forming, R2 and R1 went through init 2A, X start, exchange, loading, and full in just a matter of moments. And now each one of them has an exact replica of the LSAs. And here's what we'd expect to find. We'd expect to see in the link state database, in fact, both of them, R1 or R2, we'd expect to see two type 1 LSAs, which are from router 1 and router 2. Because if the databases are synchronized, like of all the LSAs, they should really be the synchronized in the same. So they should both have copies of each other's and their own, the LSA type ones for router one and router two, describing the links that they're connected to. And they should also now have copies of the link state advertisement that's the type two that R1, the DR is now generating because that segment 10.0.12 is no longer a stub, meaning it's no longer just me, says router one. I've got a neighbor there and he has possibilities of routing too. So it considers that area a transit area and it says, okay, now there's more than one person on this network segment. I'm going to generate a type 2 LSA. And that type 2 LSA is going to describe this network and all the routers that are connected to it. And that's my job as the DR, says the DR. And the ID for the LSA type 2 is going to be the interface IP address of the DR on that segment. So we'd expect to see the DRs are the link state ID, the link ID for that type 2 LSA to be 10.0.12.1. 10 which is the IP address on that interface where R1 is the DR. That's a mouthful, but let's take a look and verify. So we could, we could do this. This is important to remember. We could do this from either router because the link state databases, all the LSAs should be identical. And so if we did here on R2, a show IP OSPF database, and then I take that same command and take it over to R1 and paste it in, and I'm going to switch between R1 and R2. Just here, here's R1, here's R2. Here's R1, here's R2. The age has changed because they've both known about it for a different period of time, but the LSAs, <laughs> they're the same. We have two LSAs from one from router, two, two LSA type ones, one from router one, one from router two, and we have one network LSA, which is the LSA type two that's being generated by R1, the designated router. And so we could take a look at those. In fact, now that we have this LSA type 2, we could just show IP OSPF database. And the way we spell LSA type 2 
at the CLI is it's referred to as a network LSA. So we type in network, and then if you had 15 DRs that work in the area and they were all connected to a multi-access or where there's multiple OSPS speakers, if we just press this, it would just show us all the details for all the type two LSAs, that'd be a lot. So we could also tack on the link ID for the specific LSA we wanna look at. In this case, it would be 10.0.12.1, but we only have one type two LSA. <laughs> So if we press enter, that's all we're going to get anyway. I just want to share with you that you can filter that in a production environment to take a specific look and see a, a specific LSA without having 200 pages scroll by. So there it is. This is being, there's the command that says, please show me the details on the LSA type two. <laughs> and it says this was generated by router 1111. That's the designated router. Here's the link ID. And that's going to be the IP address of the interface on the designated router for that segment. That's how it's set up. And then it's showing us here who is connected to that network. So it's 10.0.12.1. This is also showing the mask. So it's a 24-bit network and there's two routers connected to it. And those are the router IDs of router one and router two. Let me look at my objectives, <laughs> our objectives. I wanted to cover two things in this live stream. I wanted to cover the fact of when our neighbors expecting to have a designated router? And the answer to that was, if the network type is broadcast, oh, let's, let me show you that real quick in case you're fairly new to this to reinforce that. If we do a show IP OSPF, hmm, let's do this, show IP OSPF interface, and let's choose, I just wanna get the right interface. Let's pick a uh, gig one zero right here. So if we selected gig one zero and looked at that interface, it's gonna show us in measurable terms what the network type is from an OSPF perspective. And there it is right there. It is, <laughs> I say there it is right there and I need to highlight that for you. So it's a, a broadcast type just because when OSPF enabled, was enabled on the interface via the network statement, it said, oh, it's ethernet, default network type is broadcast. I don't have, and we're expecting to have a DR for this segment. Also right here, it's showing the priority. So if we wanted to configure, if we had two or three routers are gonna boot up at the same time, and we wanted to control with the priority on the interface, which one was gonna be the DR, only if they came up at the same time, we could go ahead and pick one router that we wanted to win and give it a higher priority than one. One is the, the default, and if we gave some other router the priority of two and then brought them both up at the same time, the one with a higher priority on the interface is gonna win and be the DR regardless of the router ID. And then if it's a tie with the router ID, and we bring them both up at the same time, then it's gonna go ahead sorry, if it's a tie on the priority, then we bring them up both at the same time, then it's gonna be the router ID, the higher router ID is gonna go ahead and win. Okay, so let's talk about changing a few things up. If, let me bring switch one into the party. This will help demonstrate this in very graphic terms. So core one is not running OSPF, it is a multi-layer switch. And because of that, we can just pop in a logical SVI, switched virtual interface, on core one and have it join the OSPF party. That way we can demonstrate changing network types and seeing whether or not it'll still work, which is a good exercise to do just so you can see it. So we'll go to core one switch and we'll do a show VLAN brief. Oh yeah, this is, this is easy. <laughs> All of its access ports are in VLAN one. So if we just do a, let's just show CDP neighbor. Yep, so our one's out there, our two's out there. They're both in access, our VLAN number one. So we'll go into configuration mode and say interface VLAN one. So this is a switched virtual interface, a logical layer three interface we're creating and give the IP address of 10.0.12. Why? Why 10.0.12? Well, if router one and router two believe that they're on the street, the IP network of 10.0.12, and this router wants to, this device wants to play on that network, it has to agree on the street name. That's why we have to use 10.0.12 here to match the other two. You know, it's funny that IP networks are made up. They're created by network engineers who design networks. And so when a router comes up, what directly connected network is it gonna be on? It depends on what the IP address you put on the interface. And if you put the wrong IP address, it's gonna think it's connected to the wrong street. So that's all I'm doing here is making sure that switch one is on the same street as R1 and R2. So we'll give it uh, dot one, one, one. As this last octet, that's not in use. R1's using dot one, R2's using dot two and we'll put a 24-bit mask to say that the street is 10.0.12, and the last octet is the host bits. And if you need a little brush up on subnetting and IPv4 addressing, 
master playlist has all that and also the subnet saturdays has all this as well and it's done and we'll do a no shutdown just to make sure it's up and then do show ip interface brief and there we go vlan one the interface is up let's do a quick ping 10.0.12.1 that's r1's address in vlan one here that works and two Okay, and we'll do that again. So there's an ARP timeout for that initial. So in the background, we had some communication or something went on with R1 where we didn't need to resolve the ARP. So maybe R1 was doing, no, not R1 would be doing too much. In any event, uh, we are good to go with full connectivity at layer three. Let's, let's configure OSPF on this box. So router, OSPF. Now, we're in interface configuration mode. So if we want to type in exit and then do router OSPF, we could. Or you can just type in router OSPF and your process number. I'll use four just for grins. That will just jump us right there. So one of the, you don't have to follow all the rules directly. You can just jump from interface to router to other configuration modes on the router if you need to. So here in router configuration mode, we'll do router ID just to make sure I can recognize this when it shows up. And let's use 111, 111, 111. That's four octets. Also, check this out. This is fun. You may not like it, but it's interesting. <laughs> you know, an IP version four address wouldn't take that, but this is not an IP version four address. We're using by default for the router ID, the highest IP address on a loopback. And if loopback doesn't exist, the highest IP address on another interface. And those are all gonna be valid IP addresses. However, this is just a four octet number for the router ID. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> I just wanted to demonstrate that as a heads up that it's not an IP address, although it kind of looks like when it's just an idea, four octet IP address, a four octet number separated by three periods. It looks very much like an IP address, but it's just the router ID. And then we'll add network. Let's go and be very specific here. Let's say network 10.0.12.111. And I want to match on every single bit, not that many bits. <laughs> and what that says, is that okay? The router uses the same rules as before. It says how many, how many interfaces match exactly 10.0.12.111? Because the wildcard mask says you have to match on all of them. It looks down its interfaces and says, ah, I see you. Interface VLAN one, great, you're in. And then once v interface VLAN one's in, that directly connected network is also going to participate in OSPF. Now on that segment, we already have a DR R1, and we already have a BDR R2. And so in this case, core one is going to become a DR other, meaning, hey, uh, my wild, <laughs> uh, full, everything's all set. There's a DR present, there's a BDR present, and I will just become a DR other, meaning I won't be a DR or a BDR. I'll be something else like another. And I will do a full adjacency with the DR. And for backup purposes, I'll do a full adjacency with the BDR. And if other DR others show up on the network, I'll just stick in the two-way state with them. All right. so. How do we verify this? Well, so this switch is already like, yep, I see everybody, boom, full adjacency, done. That was very quick. So we'll do a show IP OSPF interface brief. Great, he's a druther, a DR other. This number right here represents how many neighbors are we fully adjacent with? And we're fully adjacent with R1 and R2, the DR and the BDR. And this count is how many total routers do I see out there running, running OSPF? So if there's like 10 routers, which is not realistic, but if there's 10 routers on that same segment, we would have full adjacencies as the DR other with two of them, the DR and BDR, and then we would have seven others that we see because we see their hellos, but we stay in the two-way state because we're not going to go further. I say seven because we're a router, DR, we're a router, DR, BDR, and then seven others. So it'd show up as seven other routers out there. And we can verify our neighborships with show IP OSPF neighbor. All right, and it says that here's the router ID of our neighbors, and we are in a full adjacency with the DR, who's R1, and a full adjacency with the BDR, who's R2. And if you wanna look at the details for that, you can actually put in the neighbor ID, the router ID, and it'll give you more, <laughs> more information than you ever wanted to know about that neighbor. But this is showing the priority of the neighbor, the current state, and what else might be interesting here 
Yeah, it's a little bit maybe more than needed. In area zero with that neighbor, the interface we're using to reach it, great. So now what have we accomplished? We've accomplished setting up a third device on that OSPF network, super. However, what I wanted to demonstrate is that if we change the requirements for having a DR or not having a DR, that will break the neighborship. If we tell this, this multi-layer switch that the network type is point-to-point -point or point-to-multi-point, it will not, it'll lose the adjacency because it's thinking, okay, no DR required. And the other two devices are assuming that there's a DR, or BD, uh, DR and BDR required for that network segment. So they have to agree. They have to agree on timers. If we change those, it'll blow up. It, they have to agree on authentication, meaning are we authenticating or not? If we don't have that correct, it'll blow up. They have to agree on the common network. So if, switch, if the core switch thought, oh, this is the network 10.0.9, not the same street, that would make it blow up. If, if the core switch thought, oh, this is area not area two, not area zero, that would make it blow up. And this, there's also some other flags associated with what type of area it is, stub area or not so stub area. They all have to match to make it work. So what I'd like to do is let's change the network type on the core switch and take a look at the results because it's gonna be pretty cool. So here on core one, the way we change the network type is we're gonna go into configuration mode for router <laughs> and now and now I get the pain of not remembering the router number. Do show IP protocols. OSPF. Oh dang. All right. So show IP do one more second. Do show IP OSPF. Do 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 do. It's right here in front of me. And let me scroll up a little bit. There's the router ID. Oh, did I use four process? I guess I did. <laughs> I thought I used like one, two, th oh, that was another route. I was like, I didn't use four, but that is showing us that indeed we did use four. Okay, so let's go into router OSPF four and we'll, s oh. To change the network type, we don't even need to go to the OSPF routing process. I was just too excited. We're going to go to the interface. So interface VLAN 1. That's interface VLAN 1 and IP OSPF network type. And we'll specify our choice here is broadcast, which is the default for Ethernet. Non-broadcast, meaning we have to hard code our neighbors. Or point to multipoint or point to point. Let's do point to point. Mm, let's do point to multipoint and press enter. So in a moment, what I expect to happen is there's a couple of things that that does for us. The timers have changed, which blows them out of the water for neighborships. Also, they have to agree on whether or not there's going to be a DR or no DR. And as a result of us making this change, we do a do show IP OSPF interface for VLAN 1. This is showing us right now that it's the network type of point to point. And this also shows the hello timers and in a point to anything, it's not gonna think it needs a DR. So let's go ahead and change the rules for all of them. And let's go back to R1 and R2. What would happen if we told R1 and R2 that those interfaces, which are gig 1, 0, and 2, 0 respectively, that they are also point to multi-point? What's gonna happen? Well, the timers are all gonna match. They're all going to agree that we don't need a DR, and, and they're gonna have a full adjacency, all three of them on that network segment because they're following all the rules of OSPF. They are on the same network, that agrees. The er the network type is using a DR or not BR, a BDR, a DR or no DR, and they're also using the same timers. Let's do that and see the results. Because a few streams ago, I posted out a, a graphic and I had a multi-layer switch with full adjacencies with like four neighbors. <laughs> and I had a lot of good ideas coming back, like how is that possible, what's going on? And that's what I did. I actually changed the network type on all the interfaces, and so they did full adjacencies. Let's go to core uh, router one, take a peek at our topology. We're gonna go to gig one zero. So here on interface gig one zero, we'll do show IP OSPF interface for gig one zero, just to verify that it's currently set to be a broadcast. Fantastic. And then we'll just change it. We'll just change it to IP OSPF network type point to multipoint. And, and 
Look at that. It said, I really like this neighbor. Boom. There was no worry about a DR or a BDR. It's a full adjacency because they both agree that no DR or BDR is needed. They also agree on the timers. The network is correct. Everything's, the area is correct. We'll do the same thing for R3. So show IP OSPF interface brief. R2. <laughs> that's why That's why it's a good thing to verify. It's like, hey, Keith, you're going over to R3. That has nothing going on here yet. So we're on R2. I want to change the interface type on 2.0. So let's do that. All right. So here on router 2, we just lost R1 because we don't agree regarding DRs and BDRs, and the timers are all wackadoodle because the timers on Ethernet are the different than the timers for OSP, uh, different than the timers for point to multipoint. So we'll go to interface. Interface gig 2.0, and we'll do a IP OSPF network type, point to multipoint. And this is going to be quick too. Boom. Fully adjacent with R1, fully adjacent with the multilayer switch. Show IP OSPF interface brief, and show IP OSPF neighbors. Look at that. Full adjacencies. So all three routers just said, great. Full adjacencies with everybody. Everything matches. The network matches. The the area type matches, the time, the counters, the timers match, and we're good to go. And since we did that, check this out. Show IP OSPF database. There's no longer a designated router with two or more routers on that segment. So as a result, there's no more type 2 LSA, no network LSA for that common segment because the network type didn't call for it. No DR was needed, no DR showed up, and they have full adjacencies. But now we have three router ID, three router LSAs that talk about every single network that's connected, and a router could use that information to piece the whole network together. So on the multilayer switch, if we did this show IP route, it says, yeah, I know how to get to the 1001 network. That's hanging off of R1. I know how to get to the 10 0 oh, 1002 network, which is hanging off of R2. And if we tried to ping somebody like that, uh, let's do that. Let's do a ping to 10.0.1.10. Let me just verify he exists. That's always helpful that the device exists. So PC1, I believe, has that IP address 10.0.1.10. We can also verify that by taking a quick look. So here's PC1. Sure enough, there's its IP address. I'm just going to copy that, go back to the core switch, and do a ping. Well, it's already there. Boom. Yep. And if we go to R2, and do a trace to 10.0.1.10. It should have full connectivity there. Not only do we have full connectivity over to that 10.1 network, it also means that R1 has full reachability back over to R3. <laughs> R2. <laughs> I don't know why R3 is on the brand. I'm just thinking of a, I have three routers in the topology. That's why I guess I'm thinking. But it has full connectivity back. And that's important in connectivity and troubleshooting is that we want to make sure that not only can a device like R2 reach a network, but also PC would need a default route using R1 coming back, and R1 would need a route back, which is directly connected to that network. Now, if we wanted to test this from 10.0.2.2, which is an IP address on this interface, we could do a ping or a trace from R2 sourcing it from this address, and that way we're verifying we have reachability all the way here and reachability all the way back to this subnet, not just to this 10.12 network or 10.0.12 network. And I think that'd be worth seeing as well just because in the you know troubleshooting with reachability, it's a bear. I mean, you want to verify end-to-end -end connectivity. So from R2, we do a show IP interface brief, and then do a we'll do a trace. We'll do a trace to 10.0.1.10, which is on the far left-hand side of the network, but we'll source it, which is the trick here. We'll source it from 10.0.2.2, which is on the right-hand side of R2, and Again, that verifies full connectivity, not just getting there, but also that traffic coming back. And then while we're here, one last peek, and then we'll we'll take a quick break and go to Q&A. This network right here is a serial link between R4 and R, R6. And so if we went by default, because it's a serial link, it's using, I believe, PPP encapsulation, by default, the OSPF network type is going to be point to point without changing it, without modifying it. It'll just assume it's point to point because of the layer two encapsulation that's already there. So let me show you that real quick on 
R4. So we make a road trip to R4, the show IP interface brief, just to make sure I'm on the right device, <laughs> which is always handy. There's our serial interface, great. And we'll do a config T, router, OSPF, process ID 1, and then network 10. Let's bring everything in. One, two, three, four, good. And basically that says, hey, any interfaces that have IPv4 addresses, you qualify. Join the party. And that's going to include loopbacks on R4 if it has any, which it does. So that's going to include one, two, three, four, five interfaces here on R4. If I put the zero there for the area. All right, now the problem here is <laughs> that I just enabled OSPF here on R4, but R6 isn't running OSPF yet. So let me just dump OSPF on that guy too. I say dump, let me, let's gently configure OSPF on that router as well. Router OSPF1 network. Look at that. That's a force of habit with adding the zeros at the end. Area zero. All right, now there's our adjacency. So on serial links with an encapsulation of PPP, it's assuming, hey, this is a point-to-point -point network. We can verify that by doing a show IP OSPF interface for serial three slash two. And there we go. That's the default network type point-to-point. -point. Now, what would happen if we change that <laughs> to be a broadcast network where they expected to have a DR? Would it work? And the answer is if they agree on the networks, I mean the IP network, and they agree on the area type and what area number it's in, and they agree on authentication, and they agree whether or not they should have a DR or BDR, yes, it will work. Uh, and we could verify that by just putting it in, but that'd be a silly thing to do to have a DR on a point-to-point -point serial network because it really wouldn't give you much benefit. There's only two devices there. We don't really need a DR and a BDR as a clearinghouse for the whole segment. So we do a show IP OSPF neighbors. There's our neighborship and it is a full adjacency. And this dash afterwards represents we are not using a DR. If we were using a DR and we didn't have a full adjacency, we could be at two-way in a normal Ethernet network. That's if we're a DR other and we have a, we're aware of another device on the network. We just be stuck in the two-way state um, with a DR. <laughs> so, if we were in a network statement network with multiple d devices, for the devices other than the DR and BDR, if we are DR other, we would be in the two-way state with those other devices, and there wouldn't be a a DR or BDR between them. So that's how some of those answers and options can come up. All right, that covers most of what I wanted to cover today. Let me take a look at my notes. I wanted to identify when a, a DR is expected. And if it's a network type of broadcast or non-broadcast, boom, we're expecting a DR. If we have the word point as the network type, point to point, point to multi-point, point to multi-point, followed by anything, including non-broadcast, non uh, that will be no DR expected. If there's a DR on the segment for Ethernet and there's no other devices on that segment, no other OSPF routers, it won't bother creating an LSA type two. We also spend a little bit of time looking at those LSAs in the LSA database, the link state database, including the type ones, which is each router talking about itself and its links. And if there's a network segment where there's, D where there's a DR and two or more speakers of OSPF, then the DR will generate the LSA, LSA type two, the network LSA, and talk about, hey, here's this network and here's everybody who's connected. Otherwise, if it's just that one router, it'll suppress the LSA type twos and won't bother wasting people's time with it. Okay, that was, that was fun. That was just about an hour. And so here's what I'd love to do. I would love to take some Q&A and here's my request, is that if you have any questions about what we've covered today, which is focused on DRs or BDRs or OSPF in general, those at the CCNA level, that would be my primary request for this channel. And then outside of that, if you have general questions at the CCNA level, that'd be perfect. Also, I invite you to join the Discord server. We're rearranging based on some feedback. We're rearranging some of the categories there to make it easier to find and so forth. So take advantage of that. And what else? Um, I think that's it. So I'm going to take a quick break. Just grab a quick sip of water and we'll be back in about maybe 30 seconds, and then we'll hang around for Q&A. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to subscribe. 
uh, get alerts when the new streams come out. If you want to put it on a schedule, I usually stream pretty consistently for the last few months on Wednesdays at Pacific Time. These are all Pacific Time. Wednesdays at 4 p.m., Subnet Saturdays at 11 a.m. every Saturday, and then CCNA Sunday, like this one, at 11 a.m. on Sundays, Pacific Time. So grab a world uh, world clock, and you can adjust the time to find out when it is. But I'm, I've been pretty consistent with those, and my intention is to keep those going until we've covered most of the topics that I feel I could bring a lot of value to and have you enjoy and really reinforce those concepts as you study and work on CCNA. And I also know that there's a lot of people in this forum and in our community here that are way beyond CCNA, and they are here to help and reinforce and serve others. And I am grateful for everybody who's doing that. And also for those of you who are just learning, this is a great place to go through. So I'll be back in a few moments and uh, we'll open up for Q&A. Thanks everybody. Life is a winding road No telling where it goes Driving through days and nights Won't stop for traffic lights And I Searching for my highs You can say I lost my mind I will keep on holding my head high Even if the sky is falling down All right, welcome back for the Q&A. Audio is on, that's always helpful. And I'm just gonna go through the queue and if you had a question earlier that was being worked on or talking with the other fellow Cisco collaborators and studying, if you have another question for me or you'd like to direct it to me, please do an at Keith Barker, make sure it's selected and then your question following that and that way I can sort them from the list from now going forward. Is that okay? Awesome, I would really appreciate that because I don't wanna miss any, any questions and that would help me in finding them. So let's start. Oh, a lot of great answers from other people in the community. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and the list goes on. Thank you very, very much for all your help, Gus, and many others. Okay, um, Murray's asking, hey, don't change the time of 11 o'clock a.m. for Europeans. Uh, my intention is to keep it consistent, so I'm, I'm hoping to keep it consistent. And there may be a, a skip now and again for major holidays or illness or something like that, but my intention is to keep that going at the same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, we have a question asking, what are the loop avoidance mechanisms in OSPF? One of the cool things about OSPF is that you're not going to have loops. Now, in single area OSPF, there's not an opportunity for loops because every router has exactly the information on the whole network. And so they know all the pieces. When we get into multiple areas and we're doing summarization, what happens is an area border router is gonna insert a, a default or a route to null zero for its summaries. And that way, if somebody's forwarding a packet to a route that's not in the ABR, the area border router, it, that it's not gonna forward, instead of just forwarding to its default route, it would send it to null zero, which is like the bit bucket for routing. So in CCNA single area with no summarization, no filtering, you're not gonna have any, no, no loops. But at area border routers, the route to null zero by default with a summary route is one mechanism that will do that. All right, Alan's asking, let me bring this over just a little bit. Alan's asking, the Discord server link, I would love to join. I think I posted it at the very beginning 
of the thread. So if you scroll to the very top, it should be there. If one of the moderators could maybe grab that and post it again, it'd be great. It's a web invite, so you just launch it from a web browser. It'll take you to there and get you in. And uh, if it if it still doesn't show up somehow, I will post it as a part of the comment for this video, which will be live and available on YouTube, I think within an hour or two. I also save the q and I used to clip off like the hour or two of Q&A at the end because I thought, oh, I'm like, anyway, I'm leaving the Q&A on. And so that's also part of the record live stream. I had somebody say, hey, Keith, default route versus default gateway, two and a half hours. Are you kidding me? And I thought, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but the, the thing about the the benefit of being here is that these Q&As and also the elaboration helps those ideas to sink in and to really, really get it. And so I, I totally empathize on that. You're right, two and a half hours. If you just want to know what a default gateway is versus a default route, and you don't want to, you know, it's a short discussion. But the elaboration, the reinforcement is what we need when we're starting off something new. It's like, why? Why does that happen? How does that happen? Um, Mark is specifying or saying that I hear the new CCNP is basically the old CCNA with a few more things added. Mm, the new CCNP, which I've been working on uh, like a madman at CBT Nuggets, is it's great. It's like they just took out all the fluff and corner case stuff that maybe didn't matter too much, and they're teaching about how it works, like the core exams or how these protocols work and the spanning tree at a very solid level with multiple spanning tree and rapid spanning tree and port fast and all that good stuff. And then routing with OSPF and multi-area OSPF and filtering with OSPF and external routes with OSPF. And also they touch on EAGRP, although EAGRP is not heavily hit. The comments are describe EAGRP and it's not, you know, configure and troubleshoot. But I'm doing due diligence on that as well. I'm making sure it's going to be solid as a rock for anybody who really wants to learn EIGRP uh, because it's still in use for people who are using DMVPNs and other overlay networks. EIGRP is often the protocol, the routing protocol of choice on top of OSPF in addition to OSPF for those those issues. All right. All right. Uh, key, uh, Dinesh is asking, how do you effectively use the clear OSPF process to switch to a different DR? That's a great question. Let's try it. <laughs> So I think we have a couple DRs that are willing to play with us here. Oh, I just changed all my network types. We can change that back. So we'll hit the up arrow key here. It's on router one, and we'll simply say no. So if you say no to a command like this, what it does is it takes off that command, and it goes back to the default for Ethernet. It's going to be a broadcast network. And we'll go to R2 and do the same thing, config T. And there's two history buffers, by the way. There's a history buffer for privilege mode, and then there's a history buffer inside of configuration mode. So to see your history, you can do, do show history inside of config mode, and it'll show you all your last commands. So if we want to get in, interface gig 2 slash 0 again, that'll work. If I put that command in but not press enter, I just won't paste it all the way in. And says, I'll do a control A and no, and that'll default. And they also need to fix the multilayer switch. Interface VLAN 1, no, I hit the up arrow key to get that command back. All right, so right now, what's happening is that these routers are duking it out. That's my, yeah, there we go. So this is the common network segment right there. So it's, it's thinking about life, considering things, and because R1 and R2 were, and R3, I'm sorry, and, and the switch, were all brought up within a small window. The one that's going to be the designated router should be the one that is the highest router ID because the priorities are all defaulted to one. So I'm interested. I'm interested in taking a look. Yep, they're going to sort that out on their own. So let's maybe go to core switch and do a show IP OSPF interface brief. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. So they're sorting that all out. In just a few moments, they'll have agreed on this common network segment, who's the DR, who's the BDR, and who is the DR other. And it'd be interesting to see. I, I think the highest, there we go. We have full adjacencies. Let's, oh, check this out. Because core one right here, it was loading to full, that means it's probably a DR or a BDR because it established full adjacencies with everybody else. Oh, there's only three devices. Yeah, 
in three devices, they're all going to have a full adjacency. Let's do a show IP OSPF interface brief. Yeah, I'm the DR. I'm the doctor, says Core One. And it was because show IP DH OSPF neighbor. And it's because I have the higher router ID. So the router ID, if you do it, the router ID for Core One was that that wacky 250 address that we put. So we just show IP, OSP, there we go. So his router ID is 254.11. And because that, and his priorities won, all the priorities are one. And as a result, they all reestablished and negotiated who's going to be the DR. This guy, Core One, had the highest router ID. And as a result, it became the new designated router. Now, if we wanted to force that and flip it, we could go over to R1, who lost. And R1 lost because it has the lowest router ID. So the first, the DR became the core switch, came, became the DR for the segment, and switch two or router two became the BDR, and then R1 had the lowest. But if we wanted R1 to be the winner, here's what we could do. We could go to the interface, gig one slash zero is the interface, and I'm just gonna make sure I'm on the right interface. Gig one slash zero is this interface right here between R1 and, and the 10.0.12 network. And in that interface, we can just simply say IP OSPF priority, and we'll give it a, a five. <laughs> That's higher than one. The default is one. And then if we reset everybody, uh, it can go ahead and renegotiate that. So the, what I'd love to do on, on the core switch, I like to take the core switch out of this for a moment. He's a little bit wacky. Well, I shouldn't say wacky. This is a kind of emulated environment. I'm going to take him out of the picture. I'm going to go to interface VLAN 1 and do a shutdown. So effectively, this is the DR going away by DR. And the existing BDR, which was R2, it should now be the DR. It's going to promote itself, show IP OSPF interface brief. And hasn't done it yet. Now, this is amazing because, yeah, what's happening is we're, we're timing out. So the hello interval is not going to be met. We're not going to see our neighbor. Eventually, we'll say, hey, I haven't heard from that guy. That neighbor's down. And then he'll say, oh, there's no DR. I'll be the new DR for this segment on 2.0. And take a look at the topology here. I just want to make sure we're on the right interface, which we are right there, 2.0. All right. Oh, there's the timer. So we just lost our neighborship because he timed out. And now if we do a show IPOSPF interface brief, the doctor is in. And behind the scenes, R1 would all then say, hey, there's no DR on the segment, no, B no BDR on the segment. I will become the BDR. We can verify that with a show IPOSPF interface brief. And there it is right there. OK, so now the question is, what if we want to flip this and we want, hold on one second. <laughs> Who did we give the higher priority to, R1? Hold on one second, this would be good, this would be really good. Great, great, this is perfect. So what happened is we, we had a BDR in place. The, B, the DR went away, and so the BDR assumed that role, and now it's the DR, and then there was an opening, and that's when R1 said, okay, great, I need to go ahead and become the BDR. The question in the queue, which was amazing, thank you for the question in the queue, was how do we reset OSPF in the event we want to have a whole new election take place between these routers? Because what we did was we had a succession that happened rather than a full new election. And one way of doing that is you could shut down the interfaces, which is going to stop all traffic, which isn't always ideal in a production environment for sure. Or we could do a clear IP OSPF process and that should do it too. So here's what I expect to have happen. Here's what I here's what might happen. How about that? I'll keep myself uh, always curious. If we, right now we have a priority of five on this interface for R1. So if we did a clear IP OSPF process on both of these routers, R1 and R2, that would trigger a loss of all of our neighborships. And then we could verify that when they come up, if they're both duking it out, we could see whether or not R1 with a higher priority in an equal battle, both of them not being the current DR, 
uh, would become the DR, even though it has a lower router ID but a higher priority. So let's test that out. I am I'm curious. So to do that, we'll do a clear I need to go into a, a fully accessible privilege mode to do that. All right, so we'll do a clear IP OSPF process. And I'm not gonna press enter yet. I'll do that on one, clear IP OSPF process. And so that doesn't actually remove the config, it just restarts it. And I will say yes to that, press enter, and R2. Yes to that, press enter. Holy schnikers, look at that. Hmm. Son of a gun. Oh, that's what we expected though, right? We, we, we wanted R2 to be on this interface, the BDR, and R1 on 1 slash 0 to be the DR because it has a higher priority. I was just being negative, I guess. Let's take a look at R1. So sure enough, we are the DR because we have a higher priority on the interface. We can see that with the show IP OSPF interface for gig one slash zero, that'll tell us. So there's our priority of five right there. And if we did the game again, let's do the game again. So config T interface gig on R2. So I want to go to two zero. We'll make it even higher just to verify. Gig two slash zero. IP OSPF um, priority, and we'll set it to seven, which is higher. You'll notice it doesn't do a show IP OSPF interface brief. You notice it doesn't change it right now, but if we reset the OSPF process, it will. So we'll do a. <laughs> How about this? Yeah, that'll work. I'm going to do that on both routers at nearly the same time. Huh, I'm not going to do it again because these are right. So if I didn't even close enough, we'll see. Show IP OSPF interface brief. Yeah, I didn't do them. Let me, let me do them closer together. <laughs> The other thing too is just to be to shut down both interfaces and bring them up or take off OSPF and put it back on. That will also do it. So if I was in a, if I was labbing this up and I just wanted to verify, you know, as far as the timers go and as far as like, are they coming up at the same time? Here's an option that would always work to verify that your priority on the interface and the election is happening from scratch. And that would be this notepad config T no router OSPF1, router OSPF1, network. Area zero. So what that's gonna do, it's gonna remove OSPF completely, put back OSPF on. Now the interface priorities, which now we have, I think we have a seven on R2, that'll still be there. It doesn't wipe out the interface config. And this will give a true test with both routers coming up at the same time and who's gonna win without giving any bias to who is the current DR and so forth. So we'll just paste that into R1 and we'll paste it into R2 and then wait. It's gonna be about probably 40 seconds or so as they identify there's no DR, no BDR and they resolve. Let's just verify, verify that we have OSPF, yeah. Oh. How is, oh, yeah, I'm looking at these 10.2. How come, how come he's a DR already? Didn't I disable it? Hold on, hold on. No router OSPF. I'm not convinced. I didn't see, I didn't see interfaces go down. I didn't see bouncing. Let's do this. You know, welcome to the world of troubleshooting and networks. No router, oh, oh, oh. I just totally shot myself in the foot. I'm not running OSPF process ID one on these routers. One of them isn't. That's why I was like, how come you're still up? You should be thinking about life. I totally, totally did that to myself. 
different, not the OSPF process one on each router. Show IP OSPF. Okay, router one is definitely using process ID one. <laughs> Oh, oh, wait, I think I'm running multiple processes. Yes, oh my gosh. So this is another proxy ARP nightmare. I mean, well, not nightmare. It has, one of the feedback pieces I got a lot of comments on was, great to see you troubleshoot. And here we go again. I have multiple OSPF routing processes now running on these routers because I wasn't using one. Let's do a show IP OSPF. And let's see what we have on our one. So we got one, that's because we just put it there. And we have 6783 that I put there earlier. All right, notepad, no OSPF1, no router, OSPF6783, because I was being tricky. Great, that'll wipe those out. Let me go check out R2, show IP OSPF, <laughs> 1 and 123. Yeah, so what I just did was I enabled an additional OSPF routing process on both routers, and that's why the adjacencies didn't all go down because they had multiple OSPF processes running. So we need to take uh, one, two, three. No, router, OSPF, one, two, three, great. And then we can put these back to back. We don't actually have to exit configuration mode. We'll then create OSPF router one, and we'll bring all the networks in, and then we are set. All right. So when life doesn't turn out what you like what you thought would happen, just investigate, and having a little bit of practice at the CLI is gonna help with that. All right. There we go. I'm expecting neighborships to go down. Fantastic. R2, same thing. And as they duke it out now for who will be the designated router on that common segment, let's take a look at the topology. On this common segment here, this 10.0.12 network, the priority here, I believe we set it to seven. The priority here is set to five. And as a result, when they both come up at the same time, there's no DR or BDR present, R2 is going to win, R1 is going to be the backup designated router, and Core 1 is just going to sit there because I disabled the VLAN 1 interface, so it's not going to participate at all. But actually, we could bring him up because if we bring him up, his default priority is 1 as well. We might have time. It's a race to the CLI. Can Oh, we're too late. They're already, they're already fully adjacent. But if we'd gone to Core 1 and we brought him up, or if we bring him up now, oh, that's nice. Unpublished <laughs> interface VLAN one, no shut. Show IP OSPF interface brief. Yeah, he's the interface is coming up and he's a DR other. So he's not and he's not fully adjacent yet, but he will be. There we go. So now if we do the same show IP OSPF interface brief, now he's fully adjacent with two other neighbors or devices on that segment, and he sees two others up here. He was going through the process of init, two-way, xstart, exchange, loading, and full. And now that he's done, he's got those two neighbors. And as far as who the DR is, we need to show IP OSPF neighbor. I'm expecting that R2. Did we, oh, did we or did we not configure OSPF priority of seven on the gig two slash zero interface? Let's find out. R2, show IP OSPF interface gig, and then make sure I have the right interface, two slash zero. Priority of seven. No do. Show IP OSPF interface gig one slash zero five. Yeah. And here's my notepad. <laughs> I disabled all the routing processes. I brought them up. All right. Well, I'm I'm eager to give this one more shot because what sh 
what I would expect to have happen is the higher priority in the interface, this isn't just like fiction, it's, this is how it really works. The highest priority on the interface should win the DR role. At least that's how I remember it. Hmm. If you're willing, let me shut this interface down. I'm going to take the core switch out of it so it's no longer a player. Goodbye. And then I'm going to remove OSPF from each of the routers and verify it's gone. So you might want to ask yourself, hey, Keith, what do you do with your days? This. <laughs> like, why isn't that working? All right. And I'm going to verify that OSPF is not running. Show. All right. OSPF is definitely not running on router one. It's definitely not running on router two, on router. So it's definitely not running on router two. It's not running on router one. And let's go ahead and put in. this oh I f excuse me we probably should go into configuration mode all right so we're going to configuration mode router ospf1 add everything in copy i'm tempted to do r2 first just so i look please work but i'm going to do the same order because i don't want to change too many variables at the same time so here's r1 here's r2 they should both be duking it out oh how come you're going to full adjacency Oh, do I have the network type still set to point to multipoint? Oh, my, do I? Hold on a second. Show IP OSPF interface brief. Show IP. No, I don't. It's in the white state. Show IP OSPF neighbor. Oh, router four. Okay. So, so here's what's freaking me out. It's like I have these neighborships that are coming up, um, but between for the segment 10.0.12 between r1 and r2 they should be going through that duke out stage and battle stage and now we have full loading between r1 and r2 and now it's to show ip ospf interface brief and and do i have the higher priority on here i can't remember now so let's check show ip ospf interface for gig two slash zero. Yeah, priority is seven. So, wow, thanks. Hey, thanks for playing with me. Um, Now it could be, I'm gonna do one more test here a little later. Uh, the, the higher priority should cause it to be the DR for the segment if both of them come up at exactly the same time. Now, unfortunately, R2 has a higher router ID. So I would also want to go ahead and swap that and put the priority over on R1 with a higher bring them both back up again, just to verify the results. Is it working like it should with the priority, which which it should, by the way, or is it some kind of wackadoodle thing with a bug I have in my code? But um, thanks for playing. That was all based on the question, how do we do a clear IP OSPF process? <clears throat> and that's how you do it, clear IP OSPF process, you press yes. But whether or not that's going to completely remove the roles for DR and BDR, I didn't see that happen in our lab environment. So in a lab environment, to be safe, I would remove OSPF, or at least bring those interfaces down, give them a chance to settle, and then go ahead and bring them back up. The LSAs also in the link state database don't go away immediately. So the LSAs could be hanging around if you have other interfaces that are running OSPF in the same area. The LSAs aren't immediately removed, and so it could be you have an LSA that's there that it believes to be accurate, and it's using that to some degree. So those are also factors that might go into it. Wow. Thanks for the question. All right, let me scroll up here. And wow, that's a lot of questions. Okay, great, great, great. Let me bring this over a little bit. And that was from Dinesh. Thank you, Dinesh. Um, what? And I'm going to focus on the CCNA stuff as we go through these. And looking for my name. All right. Okay, Michael, I'm going to take that one offline if you don't mind. If you could put that in Discord and the other questions or security questions, I'd be happy to answer it there. Thank you very much, Hello World, for that comment.
All right, and Darshan, I will uh, look into that regarding Discord and some rights. Make sure you can do what you need to do. What happens when you set the priority to zero in the current DR? That's a great question. Zero means I don't want to be the DR, meaning, hey, I'm not, I'm not participating. So the question is, what happens if we have a DR and we put in a priority of zero? And fortunately, we have an interface right here that's begging me to go ahead and try it. So this is currently to show IP OSPF interface. And we'll just do brief to see the reduced output there. Great. So we are a DR on gig 2 slash 0. And what happens if we do a priority on that interface of 0, which should mean don't be a, DD, uh, don't be a designated router. Let's try it. Interface gig 2 slash 0. There it is. All right. And IP OSPF priority and zippity doo dah, meaning if it, we are two routers that were just coming up and our priority is zero, it means don't be a DR. And now that it is the DR, let's see how that affects it. Show IP OSPF interface for gig two slash zero. And I just want to verify. Oh, look right there. State druther. It gave up the role. And we can verify that with a show IP OSPF interface brief. Thank you, Keith. Yep. So it gave up the role. So now somebody else is the DR show IP OSPF neighbors. And it would appear that R1 for that segment, this is off of gig 20, R1 took over the role of DR. So if you have a DR and its current role is, is DR and you set the priority to zero based on these results, it's going to immediately give up that role, and the BDR will step into those shoes and become the DR. And so if we did a show, and we have a full adjacency with the DR, and we'd also have a full adjacency with the BDR on that same segment, and then we'd have a two-way state with all the other druthers on that segment if there's more than four routers, if there's four or more routers on that segment. So great question, and uh, now we know. That's a good thing, too, about working with labs and practicing. Packet Tracer included, by the way. If you are curious about something, lab it up and see the results. Yesterday in Subnet Saturday, somebody said, what if, so my strategy for doing custom VLSM, which we covered yesterday, is start with your biggest subnets and then carve down. And then at the end, you can start carving out your two-bit networks and your point-to-point -point links and so forth. And then but the comment was, "Why? what would happen if you went from lower number of subnets higher? And I thought to myself, I don't remember. Does it still work? I, I think it might still work. I just have always done it a certain way from bigger to lower. To make sure, Also, it helps to make sure we have enough room. You're going to discover very quickly if you start with your biggest subnets, if you're running out of bits or not, there's not a space. Where if you start with the small ones and then you get to the biggest subnets, you're like, oh, at the very end of this, there's not enough host bits available <laughs> for this subnet. That could also uh, save you some grief. So those are great questions. Lab it up, lab it up, lab it up. All right, Florida's in the house. Hi, Brian. And Royalty answered the question before I labbed it up. Thank you for that, by the way. Fantastic answer about the DR going to zero for priority on the interface. All right. And Van, we have a lot of people who have joined us for a lot of these live streams. I'm so grateful to have you. And let's see here. Other questions. Oh, yeah. Great, 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 great. I'm looking just for my name so I can make sure I'm not jumping in other people's conversations. And Murray's st stating, regarding the new studio, it never happens unless there are pictures. I'd be interested to see a pictorial of the build. You know, Murray, that's a great idea. I thought, oh, I could I could um, document this as I go just by taking a few snaps, maybe not a whole videography thing. So I'll start. Yeah, it's easy. I got a phone. Click, click, click. I got a camera. So the other day, what time was it? Th Friday. Yeah, it was Friday night. And my daughter had a practice. My wife was in a play. She was performing there. And so I had like two and a half hours. I just got a sledgehammer and a screwdriver, a drill, a cordless drill, screwdriver. And I started taking down stuff that I felt I could heft. Like, that cabin, I think I can do that. I was right on three of them. <laughs> and some are just too heavy. I'll need two people to lift some of that stuff out. So, yeah, I'll start taking pictures. I'll, I'll make a little documentary as it goes through. Th thanks for the request, Murray. Great idea. Ah, great. Uh, people who have been 
you know, following us and, and joining our community and coming back year after year. So good to have you here to help with the other people. And Michael, you are so welcome. And the question from Kenny is, Eve and G, is it good? Any simulator or emulator, Eve and G is an emulator where you actually put images in and it, the software believes it's running on the hardware. As far as functionality, it all works. Most of it works. I mean, Eve and G, the technology works. The question is for the CCNA level, is that how much effort and time and pain and suffering and hardware do you have to have on your laptop and computer to get it working? I, I remember hours and days of trying to get GNS3 in a workable situation. I made some serious videos on it a long time ago. And I still enjoy a good GNS3 session from time to time, but for a new person who just wants to practice like OSPF neighborships and priority and, and configuring networks, like the, what we're supposed to be focusing on and not how to troubleshoot the emulator, Packet Tracer is a great solution. For the CCNP level, I would invest a couple hundred dollars a year on Viral, V-I-R-L, which is Cisco's product. You license it. it takes a, version 2.0 is coming if it's not already out, and it's, it's great. So it allows you to do tons and tons of work and configurations with a lot of different products, firewall products included. So if a person's serious about hands-on practice and they want to make it as easy as possible after the infrastructure set up, and you can afford the $200 for a full year of access for the, the license from Cisco, Viral is a very strong offering at the NP level. But for entry level, Packet Tracer is absolutely free. Michael, you're welcome. And everybody else with the great comments, thank you very much. And let me see if there's... Keith, can you recommend a wireless LAN controller for the CCNP? If you would put that in the Discord in the other section, I will... I or one other, another community member can get to that. It, I need to look at the blueprint and see what they're going to be testing on specifically for wireless. And that's that's the wireless LAN controller I'd be focused on is the one that Cisco is going to have. And I haven't seen the that exam yet, but I'll like look at the blueprint and probably can make some estimations. Okay. All right, Chance Pio, welcome to the welcome to the channel. Good to have you here, and some kind thank yous. And so I would say viral for CCNP versus GNS3, just because you're going to need some gear occasionally that acts, looks, feels exactly like it does in a production environment. And there's a lot more options with viral that they just you just grab them. You need a firewall. You need to do policy-based routing. You need to have a big topology to start with all very, very easy once you get right. There's a learning curve with Viral, but not as much as with other products like Even G or GNS3. Um, once you get Viral going, then you have all these licensed opportunities to do all the work you need to do, which is great. Okay, and <laughs> so uh, Brian's asking about PFR, which is definitely out outside the scope of performance-based routing, which is out of the scope of <laughs> CCNA. So if you want to ask that in the Discord, anything that's outside the scope of CCNA that you would like to ask, go ahead and add that. There's another section in our Discord server. Also, got some feedback on making some new channels and reorganizing that. Here's my intent. My intent is for the Discord server, I have six sections that we're going to have for recommendations for videos. So in those channels, and, and I'll we'll steer everybody to that as well. In those channels, just recommendations on what you would like to see most many times Somebody make a post in there, and then another person will post, hey, here's a link to that exact video that's already in the library that Keith has made for YouTube. So if there is a topic there that isn't, I'm going to just keep that as a holding tank for ideas so I can find out, oh, that is a good idea. Let's do that, or let's do that. So there's going to be a section for ideas, what you would like to see in a video, and also possible links to existing videos so you can very easily find it. It's all in the master playlist, by the way. And then a separate section for the CCNA topics based on domain as well where you can talk about them, ask questions, challenge questions, and discuss them and so forth. And that's the goal, to kind of separate those two. That way it gives me an opportunity to find out, oh, we have like a lot of people that would really love a video on this topic. Maybe it's software-defined networking. Maybe it's how do I use my first API with Postman? Or how do I interpret JSON? Or how do I do ISIS and MPLS traffic shaping? No. <laughs> that one would go in the other category. I'm just messing around. But topics that are related to CCNA, I definitely want to know what you want to see in the video. And uh, other topics, if you have, well, put those in the queue, that's fine too. And then a separate discussion area. 
All right. And Cisco Cybertech is saying we just uh, benchmarked 100 people on Discord. Fantastic. And we just, I think we just brought that up. It wasn't just yesterday, was it? Was it maybe it was Wednesday of last week? Anyway, it's only been up for a couple of days. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I don't see any other questions for me at the moment, but have no fear. There's going to be another live stream on, it is Sunday. So Wednesday, here's the schedule going forward. Wednesday afternoon, Pacific time, 4 p.m., there'll be a live stream, CCNA focused. On Saturdays, there's going to be an 11 o'clock a.m. stream which has been happening for like eight weeks now for subnet Saturday, where we're going to be cumulative. Meaning if you're going to join us for a CCNA Saturday, I would encourage you if you have time to go through the playlist, which is on my YouTube channel, just go through in order and you can just browse. Say, yep, I understand that part. I understand that. I understand that. And that way you'll learn the basics of IPv4 and you'll learn the basics of what a mask does and how to do binary to decimal, decimal to binary and the block size technique and the finger game and then applying that to carving out subnets. And then yesterday we did carving out VLSM and why variable length subnet masks are important to make it fit. Otherwise we can't have our, our network in place because there may not be enough room if we don't do VLSM. And then as we continue that journey, we're gonna take a look further at additional topics like summarization, how to build network designs based on summarization, how to do it, how to do it with routing protocols, how to actually implement summarization. Also talk about null routes for the benefit of not, not having loops, if we are doing summarization. And the list goes on. So we're gonna build on that. There'll probably be four or five more Saturdays at least in that playlist. We invite you to join us for that. And then Sunday is another CCNA Sunday where we're gonna focus on CCNA topics. And here's what I'm gonna do. If you're on Discord, I'm just gonna go to those Discord channels for rec suggested videos, what you'd like to see. And that's the list I look at. In fact, that's the list I looked at this morning, about four hours ago when I discussed this topic today about the DR or no DR based on the network type and whether or not there's gonna be an LSA type two or not based on if there's other network devices on that same common network segment. So that idea was straight out of the comments I'd read on Discord. So please feel free to add re recommendations there. And uh, a couple other questions, one from Rafael asking, I think JSON interpretation is on the new CCNA. Oh, yes, it is. The whole module six is about software defined networking, I think automation and programming or automation and programmability. They're not expecting you to do XML or do uh, coding to actually implement automation, but they want to understand what it is. So yes, definitely is there. And Murray, you're very, very welcome. And Lewis, that question regarding loop avoidance, if you'd post that in the Discord in the other section, I don't want to lose any of those questions. And if I have time, I'll go ahead and answer those. Also, I've got a, a the email, <clears throat> contactthekeithbarker.com, contact at thekeithbarker.com. I check that maybe once a week and I, like an hour or two, just going through that. So if you have a comment or something in there that's new, I'm still working on that. So it's not lost. I'm just prioritizing the time that I have and I will get to your... Um, I will see your email if you've sent it there regarding Discord or anything else. So have no fear. I'm looking at those at that periodically. And Hamzix is asking, hello, Keith. I want to ask you about Cisco certs. There are so many. Yes. So as of the 24th of February this year, 2020, they got rid of most of the CCNAs, meaning the you can no longer test on CCNA. There's now one new CCNA. It is very fair exam from what I've heard and seen and talked to people about. Very straightforward, six domains from basic nuts and bolts to layer two switching to routing and security, IP services and network automation and programmability. It's a really good solid foundation. And then after that, you can go ahead and jump into the professional level type content which involves getting, if you want to, you can get a CCNP certification or you just get specializations. I have a five minute video <laughs> on YouTube that discusses that certification process and the options there. And it's actually almost six minutes. I tried to do it in five, but it ended up being close to six minutes. But that's a great way to just get a high level overview of what you can study for and how you can get it and how you can move forward. And everybody who's saying thank you you're so welcome. Thank you for the moderators and everybody else who's supporting and helping, just answering questions left and right. I appreciate that. Yes, and Royalty's asking, did we cover how the priority is selected, if not manually? 
and subsequently and how the router ID, yep. So the router ID, how that's selected, we've covered that a few times. And also, we've also talked about the priority being a default of one. So unless you mess with the IP OSPF priority on the interface, the default is one, which would then default to the router ID being the tiebreaker if both routers come up <clears throat> at the same time to be the DR. And the winner is gonna win. I guess that's redundant. All right. Hey, thanks everybody. I'll see you in the next stream, which will be Wednesday, uh, that, which is coming up in three days at 4 p.m. Pacific. Give me your recommendations in Discord, and we'll see everybody in that live stream, I hope. Thanks, everybody.